of uh, Ludovico, and it, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Okay, <coughs> can you hear me? So yeah, I'm Ludo. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I work at the Statistical Physics of Genomes and Cells Labs in Milan at IFOM and the uh, University of Milan. It's a group of uh, Marco Agomarsino, who is also here. So in my research, I broadly work on different aspects of cell growth and uh, protein synthesis. And today I'm going to talk about, I'm a theoretician, so I uh, mainly do uh, mathematical modeling. And today I'm going to talk about how protein synthesis can limit growth with a focus on total mRNA, since we believe that that's an interesting aspect, given some recent data that's been uh, overlooked. Um, <clears throat> so before going to the main topic of this uh, uh, talk, uh, just some definitions. So growth is, of course, fundamental in cell biology and physiology. Uh, but there are some subtleties sometimes in its very definition. Growth involves many mechanisms. You can grow mass, you can grow volume, and you can grow surface. So I just want to say that I'm going to focus on mass here, so biomass uh, addition, and specifically protein synthesis. It is partially because most of the mass, most of the dry mass is really uh, protein mass, at least 50% or above across most organisms. All right, so in the literature, there are uh, these relationships that link um, key quantities of protein synthesis to growth. So you've seen these plots repeatedly during the last few days. So just to uh, remind you, perhaps, um, so here on the left, you see, uh, for instance, the relationship between the ribosomal content as proxied by the ribosomal fraction uh, against the growth rate. And you see that the ribosomal fraction grows with the growth rate. And this is the case both for E. coli and uh, budding yeast, interestingly. And uh, one typical interpretation of this is that <coughs> to grow faster, you really need to increase your ribosomal content. So in some sense, ribosomes are limiting to uh, grow faster at least when you perturb, when you modulate the growth rate with uh, uh, nutrients. So more recently, um, people in uh, Ferris West lab have found another relationship between the total mRNA concentration and the growth rate. And interestingly, the total mRNA concentration increases with the growth rate as well. So <clears throat> even if this is perhaps a, a bit naive, but you might um, have a similar interpretation to the one I've uh, outlined before, and you could say that perhaps you also need to increase your total mRNA concentration to grow fast. Of course, this is not necessarily the case because this is just a correlation, so it's hard to infer causation, but it's an interesting question to ask at least, I think. So for yeast, I'm not aware of such a curve. If you are, uh, please let me know. But on the other hand, we have evidence from another line of research that mRNA may be interesting in setting some uh, uh, growth limitations. And this line of research is the so-called growth cost of uh, overexpression. Um, <clears throat> so this is a, a pretty well-known concept in the physiological community, um, but no, no, not only that one. So um, to explain that briefly to somebody who perhaps hasn't seen this, you see this plot on the left. On the y-axis, you have the growth rate. And on the x-axis, you have the proxy of your uh, uh, overexpressed proteins, okay? So this is a protein that for all purposes doesn't do anything. It's unneeded. And uh, you see that the growth rate goes down as you overexpress more of these uh, unneeded proteins. And uh, the typical, um, uh, the standard framework to understand this is to say that as you overexpress more of this protein, you <coughs> are allocating less ribosomes to proteins that are actually useful for growth, such as uh, ribosomal proteins themselves. Uh, which causes the uh, growth rate uh, to, go, to go down. So more recently, there's been an experiment in budding yeast, <laughs> which is very similar. So they overexpress uh, unneeded proteins as well. But they have another control parameters, which is the stability of your uh, unneeded transcript. Okay? So you overexpress uh, a, certain, uh, a certain gene, a certain unneeded gene, and you're also able to tune the stability of this unneeded, uh, of the transcript corresponding to this unneeded gene. It's, and what they see, it's basically that you get two curves when you uh, tune the stability. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's super clear what the intuition be behind this shift is. But the question would be, uh, can the standard framework um, explain this shift, basically? And um, uh, if not, it, does mRNA um, limitation play a role in, in here, basically? And this is uh, part of what my talk is going to be about. 
So from a theoretical standpoint, uh, people have tried to systematically categorize what uh, limits protein synthesis and one well-known uh, work have identified two regimes uh, which, uh, which we termed uh, w one regime we call the translational limited regime. In this regime, uh, biophysically, what happens is that there are a few ribosomes on the transcripts, as you see in this picture here. And uh, <clears throat> therefore, the, number of the ribosome number is really what limits uh, protein synthesis. On the other hand, you have uh, another regime which you can characterize biophysically by the fact that the transcripts are really spatially saturated by ribosomes, okay? So in this case, what matters for protein synthesis, what limits protein synthesis is rather the number of uh, mRNAs, okay? This is because uh, if you have another ribosomes, you cannot just uh, bind on the transcript in this case, but you need other, uh, you need other mRNAs. So in this slide, I <clears throat> sort of want to claim that neither of these uh, two regimes fully um, explains, um, seem to fully explain uh, the observation that I've uh, um, shown you so far. So in the translation limited regime, it's rather um, uh, intuitive, I think, to say that the ribosomal fraction would increase with the growth rate, but it's not really clear why the mRNA concentration um, would increase with the growth rate. And uh, <coughs> I'll try to show, that, and you can make a similar argument for the growth cost of our expression. Um, <coughs> If you do the standard experiment, uh, the theory based on uh, resource uh, location of ribosomes uh, reproduces very nicely the data. Uh, but this recent data where it, people uh, also tune the um, transcript stability is perhaps a bit harder to uh, understand. So with this, I want to formulate what are our questions, given uh, all I've said so far. So the first one is a bit more of a conceptual question, I guess. Um, so how can, well, we want to try to understand if there are some uh, uh, limitation regimes of protein synthesis where both mRNA and ribosomes limit growth, okay? So the idea is that perhaps there are regimes on top of the two that I've outlined above that are um, known in, in the literature. And then we want to try to use this uh, more uh, theoretical framework <coughs> to try to understand some, or so try to help understand some of these observation, including the fact that mRNA increases the cells grow faster and also <laughs> these uh, overexpression experiments where people tune also their um, transcription machinery. All right. So I'll go to the results section here, starting with the first question. And uh, so, yeah, I'm a, um, uh, I'm a theoretician, and really this part of the work is mainly uh, model-driven, I would say. And to try to tackle this question, we define a central dogma model with, the, the, with both transcriptional and the translation layer. Um, the <coughs> key feature of this model is the, ribosome, the competition for ribosomes from uh, mRNAs and the competition for RNAPs from uh, uh, genes. I'm not gonna go into all the details, but I wanted to uh, at least catch a little bit uh, in more detail the translation layer, which is uh, key to uh, try to answering our first question. So our picture, picture, our simplified picture of translation is uh, <coughs> exemplified here in this cartoon. So ribosomes uh, elongate on the transcript with a certain uh, elongation rate, and they uh, bind to the transcript with a certain initiation rate. There's a pool of three ribosomes that binds to the transcript. Um, <coughs> this uh, ribosome density here, it's um, a parameter that characterizes basically the amount of, uh, you can say that it's a proxy of the amount of spatial saturation on the transcript. So given this picture, <coughs> we introduced two key assumptions for our model. And the first one is that translation is really uh, initiation limited. So you can write um, um, some equations. This is the, the simplest one, where the pertinent production rate is proportional to the number of transcript times an initiation rate. And we say that initiation rate is proportional to the concentration of uh, free ribosomes. <coughs> the second um, assumption is that there is a steady uh, ribosome density. Uh, this is, I think, fairly intuitive. So uh, what this means here is really that the uh, uh, initiation current, so to speak, must be equal to the current on the transcript. And this is reflected in this equation here, where you have the initiation rate that must be equal to the uh, current uh, on, the, on the transcript. There are some cutouts here, uh, if you like. Uh, um, Philip, the other day, talked about some of these things. But uh, if you want to know more details, we can talk about this later. 
uh, but in, within some approximation, this is all true. The important point here is that from these equations, you get the relationship between the uh, free ribosomes and the uh, bound ribosomes. And if you work out basically uh, some algebra, you can uh, re-express the protein production rate in terms of the total concentration of ribosomes and the total concentration of mRNA. So <laughs> I'm going to skip the steps uh, for this presentation, <coughs> but here you see kind of the result of that. And I, I want to quickly outline what are these uh, terms here. But you see that the protein production rate is now expressed as a function of the total amount of mRNA and the uh, number of ribosomes. So indeed, uh, here you have the number of ribosomes, so the production rate is proportional to the number of ribosomes. But you have this kind of uh, mutualized Menten term here, <laughs> which, it's really, uh, which really can be interpreted as the fraction of uh, bound ribosomes. Uh, and you see that it's, uh, there is a key parameter here that will determine how much the uh, total mRNA concentration matters uh, in this rate. Uh, okay, this is a translation rate, and uh, this can be interpreted as the fraction of ribosome translating this particular protein on this particular sector. This is not that important, though, for our purposes, because we're really interested in the total protein production rate, right, uh, which is a proxy of the total mass. So you just sum up all, all of these equations, and you obtain that <coughs> you have that the total protein production rate is proportional to the number of ribosomes times this kind of michaelis menten factor that depends on the total mRNA concentration. So, <coughs> of course, the key would be, uh, the key is this parameter that in this model sets how much total mRNA is important as well. But what I want to stress here is that both components, right, both ribosomes and the total mRNA here appear in the total protein production rate. So the two components are co-limiting in a sense, and there isn't just a single limitation um, in the system. All right, so next I'm going to be a, a bit more uh, sloppy, <laughs> but this is kind of the picture that we have for uh, translation. So <clears throat> we have had identified three uh, limitation regimes. Two of them <clears throat> are similar to what uh, are really identical to what has been proposed in the literature before. So the translation limited regime only in the translation limited regime only ribosomes determine the total protein production rate. And this has the same uh, biological interpretation. Few ribosomes are on the transcript. In what we've called the transcription limited regime, all the mRNA matters for the protein production rate. And you have uh, the similar uh, um, biological interpretation. But we also find basically an intermediate regime, some, something that you might call an intermediate regime, which you have termed this uh, complex uh, formation uh, limitation regime. And in this case, both ribosomes and uh, uh, total mRNA levels um, um, matter for setting the total uh, protein production rate. So I want to talk a little bit more about this one um, <clears throat> in terms of what's the intuition behind it. And then I'm going to try to uh, see how it might connect to the data. So to give you an intuition about this, I'm going to show you a toy model of this toy model, basically. And uh, you can, in this uh, simple model of reaction kinetics, we imagine that you have two species, A and B. And they form a complex AB with a certain binding constant. And once you have a complex, you produce a product P, and you also dissociate, <coughs> and so you can uh, do all of this again, basically. Um, so this is highly irreversible, of course, but you can still write down a few equations and use mass action kinetics to get the uh, total uh, production rate of your product P. And we really get a kind of... Uh, <coughs> Uh, pseudo phase diagram that really looks like the one that I've shown you for the more uh, biological model. Basically, in two um, regimes, you have that the total product rate is proportional to just one of the two uh, components, either A or B, depending on which one is present in the least amount. But you also find a third regime here <coughs> where the total um, product rate is proportional to, um, to uh, the to, uh, to the concentration of A times the concentration of B. So in this case, both species, uh, you can say that the species are co-limiting for, uh, for your product rate. So we call this the complex formation limiting um, limitation regime because uh, you can show that <coughs> the important step here, the limiting step here, it's basically uh, this part of this uh, diagram here. So if uh, the step that is limiting in the reaction is the formation of the complex, then you will get a, a 
production rate that is uh, dependent on both species. So you can imagine to make a kind of draw an analogy between these abstract species and the more concrete ones that we are considering. So A would be the mRNA, B would be the ribosomes, and P might be the proteins. <coughs> and uh, of course, this is just uh, to give you a hand with the intuition, but you can see that <coughs> we can interpret things in a similar way. And these uh, two limitation regimes, and we draw an analogy between these two limitation regimes in the toy model and in the more uh, biological, bi biological model. All right. Um, <coughs> so, just to take a, perhaps a little break, I just wanted to mention that uh, you can make a, a similar kind of um, uh, argument, and you can make a, a similar kind of uh, diagram for transcription as well. So, <coughs> you have similar interpretation, but with DNA and uh, RNA polymerases instead. For the purposes of uh, this talk and most of our work, for the transcription layer of the model, we focus on the situation where um, mRNA synthesis is limited by uh, RNA uh, polymerases, but we're also exploring um, all the combinatorics here. And uh, yeah, Philip was talking about some of this uh, the other day. Okay, <coughs> so uh, we try to go to the next two questions now. And uh, so the next, uh, the next question that we wanted to try to uh, sort of address is why uh, should the mRNA increase the cells uh, grow faster? So to do that, uh, we use our model to uh, derive uh, how mRNA changes with the growth rate by uh, optimizing the cellular composition across, uh, across uh, uh, nutrient conditions. So of course, optimization may be very naive. We, uh, people have talked about this uh, quite a lot in these few days. But we still did it to uh, try to get a feel of what happens in that case, at least. So <laughs> we tried to get the uh, mRNA against the growth rate by doing this optimization. We also added another uh, ingredient that's based on uh, data from uh, E. coli. And this ingredient is uh, something that <coughs> is basically an increase in transcription efficiency. So what this means is that as growth conditions improve, <coughs> uh, people have shown that RNA polymerases become more active uh, with a growth rate. And when we mix this, uh, when we mix, uh, when we consider our model in the complex formation limited regime uh, on top of this uh, ingredient, we really find, we find that <coughs> the mRNA concentration is linear with the growth rate. And importantly though, the, the crucial point is really that you have both growth laws, right? You have both the mRNA growth law and the ribosomal growth law. So next, I just wanted to mention um, uh, what happens if you remove the second ingredient, okay? So this increase in transcription efficiency. efficiency. Um, so this is, uh, this is the curve that I've just shown, so uh, with, this, uh, with this extra ingredient motivated by the data. But if you just assume a constant transcription efficiency, you, in the model, we get a, a, a curve of the total mRNA concentration that still increases with the growth rate, but you get a kind of a square root growth law. <coughs> Uh, rather than a linear growth law. So qualitatively, uh, still makes sense, perhaps, but you, but you get a, a striking uh, difference at the quantitative level. Okay, so I'll go to my final questions, um, <clears throat> which is basically whether we can uh, interpret these uh, overexpression experiments when people also uh, modulate um, transcriptional uh, quantities. So I'll just remind you that uh, uh, our inspiration here is this experiment where people have overexpressed a certain protein in budding yeast, and then they also change the stability of the uh, unneeded protein, okay? So you overexpress an unneeded protein, and you change the uh, mRNA stability of this unneeded protein as well. And you get these uh, two curves, basically. So the idea is, uh, what happens when you uh, do this, um, uh, what happens in our model in the different limitation regime when you try to apply this perturbation? All right, and to do that, we first looked at the translation limited regime, so where all the ribosomes are really important for the protein production rate. And you see on this plot, on the y-axis, you see the relative growth rate. So here it's, uh, there is no uh, unneeded protein, there is no overexpression. And here, uh, this is a proxy basically of the level of unneeded proteins, okay? So this is kind of the standard uh, curve that you might have seen before. And the different colors here are a proxy of the uh, relative, the relative stability of the unneeded transcript. And uh, <clears throat> so the, 
the, the darker the color, the more unstable, and the uh, lighter the color, the uh, more stable. And what you see here, indeed, is that <coughs> all of these curves are basically on top of one another, okay? So the shape of this curve doesn't really change when you uh, change the stability of the transcript. Which is not really what you see, what you saw in those data in Vadim Yeast. So when you look instead at what happens in the complex formation limitation regime, this is uh, exactly the same plot, okay? So same legend here. And uh, you see that the curve, as you change the stability of the transcript, do not sit on top of, on top of one another. But instead you get a steeper uh, slope as you make the transcript more unstable. Uh, and this is an interesting qualitative difference between this uh, limitation regime for this cost of protein over expression. So the kind of explanation for this, or a very rough explanation for this, is that <coughs> within our model, <coughs> as you uh, produce a certain unneeded proteins, you always get a decrease in the uh, ribosomal fraction, but also in the total mRNA concentration. But if you decrease the total mRNA concentration in this ribosome-limited regime, really the growth rate isn't affected. While in the complex formation-limited regime, <coughs> the decrease in the mRNA also affects the growth rate. So you have an extra effect to, to, uh, on the growth cost, and this is really what causes the uh, differences in the slope here. All right, then uh, to basically conclude, I'll uh, just show you uh, that we've tried to um, <coughs> use our model for, this, uh, uh, for, mo for uh, reproducing this real data. We, we are able to uh, use the um, <coughs> uh, overexpression experiment in the stable mRNA condition to fit the parameters of the model. And therefore, we make a real prediction under uh, mRNA stability uh, change. And you see that under the translation, translation limited regime, of course, the slope remains the same. You cannot get this, uh, um, this uh, kind of shift. While in the complex formation limited regime, you will get uh, a nice fit on the curve when you uh, make the transcript uh, unstable. All right, so <laughs> with this, I'm basically uh, done. I'll just summarize briefly um, what I said. So our first question was more of a conceptual one. So how can both mRNA and ribosomes limit growth? And our answer is this complex formation li limiting regime where it's the formation of the uh, mRNA ribosome complex that is limiting. And this kind of emphasizes this, uh, this I think it points to uh, perhaps exploring also, this was perhaps exploring also cases where you don't have just a single limiting components, right? But you have co-limiting components. Um, in the, uh, in our second question was basically try to try to um, uh, somehow um, help understanding this uh, kind of mRNA growth law, right? And uh, we showed that within our model, you you would have such a law if cells live in the complex formation limiting regime. It isn't this the, isn't necessarily the case that they do, right? But still, it's um, it's uh, somehow a way to validate the complex formation limiting regime. Finally, we try to ask what is the overexpression growth cost due to transcription. And the idea is that if, the simple idea is that we use this complex formation limiting regime. If total mRNA goes down during the overexpression experiment, uh, growth is affected in this regime. And this explains uh, uh, the, uh, that pattern that you saw in the overexpression experiment in Vadim uh, uh, Yeast. All right, so with that, um, I'm finished. And I'd be happy to uh, take any questions. So this is our work uh, by archive if you want to uh, know more. Thank you. So you said you optimized this, uh, this model. Uh, what are the costs to having too many mRNAs? How is this entering your model? Right. So the, we optimize, we basically are able to obtain an expression of the growth rate in terms of the uh, protein fractions, okay? So the ribosomal fraction, for instance, and we also have a, an RNA polymerases fraction, okay? So the trade-off is basically between making ribosomes and between making uh, RNA polymerases in this case. Sizable, uh, yeah. it, it is, uh, the RNA polymerase fraction is, is pretty small, actually, in, in E. coli. Uh, 
uh, as far as I know. Model, yeah, yeah, it is included in the model, yeah. Very nice model, thank you. I wonder if you or somebody else try to break down the mRNA into the mRNA responsible for production of ribosomal proteins and the rest of mRNAs. Would this linear trend persist, experimentally persist in both sectors? Um, so, so if I understand your questions, um, in, uh, in this uh, Balakrishnan's paper, People have looked at the uh, mRNA pie, if you like, which I think it's what you're, what you're asking. Right, about. right. Exactly. And I, I haven't read the paper. That's yeah, why yeah, maybe yeah. it's... Uh... And the mRNA pie and the protein pie is really uh, roughly similar, okay, for most proteins. So you can argue that the allocation, the ribosome allocation fraction, okay, it's basically the uh, amount of mRNA corresponding to a certain sector divided by the total amount of uh, mRNA. And if the fraction of the but, pie of ribosomal but, grows and the other one grows linearly, what does happen to the Yeah, maybe, rest? maybe, uh, maybe, yeah, I wanted to add that. The point is that the, the, the behavior of these fractions, though, really do not tell you anything about the total mRNA fraction, right? Okay. So it, you have to do something else for understanding the total mRNA concentration, basically. Okay. Yeah, actually, it's a very similar question. So it, the, a lot of plots we saw about growth laws were like total, total RNA to protein fraction that changes with growth mm -hmm. rate. But if the mRNA changes the, uh, not the same way as the rRNA, doesn't it actually change a little bit? So the total mRNA to protein fraction maybe is not exactly like the ribosome fraction anymore. Uh, so you're saying that the total rRNA over protein? Like we need to only look at rRNA, I guess, to really know. Right. To really know what the pro the ribosome fraction. Uh, yeah, but but uh, but 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 it's oh. interesting. By its uh, yeah, the mm -hmm. perhaps you're just saying that the mRNA is small compared to the rRNA. Yeah, maybe if if one of them is much smaller, then it's easy. Yeah, that's right. But okay. but uh, but it's still interesting to ask what is the trend of the total mRNA, right? Okay. No, no, of course, yeah, and. I guess maybe it's a long uh, answer, but can you uh, give a little intuition why you got like a quadrat uh, square root uh, uh, yeah. solution for the sure. non-changing sure. version? Um, yeah. I guess that, so perhaps this, the simple explanation uh, mathematically is that if you imagine that your growth rate is proportional to one sector times another sector, okay? Uh, and there is something like a constraint, okay? So I'll just do some things like that, okay? You can imagine that your maximum growth rate here is basically when they are equal, okay? And therefore you have, uh, in, the, in the optimization solution, you have like lambda equal pi one uh, to the power of two, okay? And if you invert it, you get a square root uh, growth law, okay? And there are similar arguments in some regimes, yeah? Thanks. I, I just want to add a few words. My, you know, your, your analysis is, is good, right? The, but then somehow the message is coming I mean, from the questions that have been asked here. Mm -hmm. I think the message come out a bit the, the, uh, off, okay? Right. I mean, the, the, and, and the thing is, there's, mRNA is not a limitation, mm -hmm. right? So resource is tiny, right? It's compared to ribosomal RNA, so far they ask. It's tiny, okay? And then the RNA polymerase is also tiny. So the, but, but it's more, uh, uh, Right, okay, but then if you, you can easily, right, so the cell purposely titrate away uh, RNA polymerase, so it's not saving any resource to reduce the mRNA, right? But the, the, you know, that's what, what it's doing, that's fat, right? And so, so it, it's more at the, at the level of, a, but it does that, of course, you can describe uh, to me, yes, there, there are, say, co-limitating, but it's a self-imposed co-limitation, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And uh, so then, uh, then our view is more um, like that, okay, the cell knows that at the protein level there's a constraint, and uh, now you could you could you you have to deal with that constraint. The constraint is a constraint, right? And it is kind of preempting. So so if you just make lots of mRNA, then that, the constraint will be implemented at the level of a, a ribosome need to choose which mRNA to make, right? But it's uh, preventing that random choice by the polymerase by pre-limiting the mRNA. 
right? It's projecting the constraint onto the mRNA level so that there's never confusion. That's why we see the parallel uh, pie chart for the mRNA and for the protein. So, so yeah, but then if you think about it as an optimization thing, oh, then, then, then it's, a, it's a limitation that still has to deal with it. There's no resource problem at all. Uh, well, I, I think I would, I would agree with, it, with uh, some of those points. Well, the part of the work, though, is just, is just you know, exploring a th more theoretically some limitation regimes, okay? The what? Part of the work is just exploring, uh, right, theoretically some limitation regimes, okay? Yeah. The interpretation of the data, though, yeah, I agree that I it's mean, it not is, at the end, you're right, I mean, it's core limiting, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a self import it's not, yeah, but, but so, well, this is our view that uh, it's a self-imposed one because you know there's a limitation right, ultimately, right, right. but there's no, really no limitation at MRNA level. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. All right, any more questions? All right, that seems not the case. Let's give uh, Ludovic a hand again, and we will reconvene at 40.